All right, Vetrepreneurs, welcome to the latest session of the Warrior Rising Coaching Academy. If this is your first time, we welcome you to the tribe. And if you've been here before, we're excited to have you back. I'm Griffin Murray, your Director of Coaching. Before we begin, we have a few administrative items. We want to let you know that we are recording this session and you're all on mute. Please stay muted until you go into your coaching session. If you have any questions, please put it in the chat. Our next Warrior Rising coaching session will be Wednesday, September 7th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So please put it on your calendars. All right, so as many of you know, we have a very special VIP guest speaker here tonight, retired General Stanley McChrystal. I'll be introducing him in just a moment but we also have a few members of our executive staff in our session. Our founder and director, Jason Van Camp, our director of programming, Sarah Bell Heisen, and our chief of staff, Ken Venera, who will take a moment to describe our Warrior Rising process for any of our new veterans who are here tonight. Ken? Thank you, Griff. It's basically uh, the way our program works is that we have uh, hopefully uh, in an app that's gonna be launching soon, but a, an intake process where we ask you a lot of questions that are necessary to understand whether you're really ready for this process to you know, undertake starting a business. After that, you go into Warrior Academy, which is 40 modules based off of a military operations order so that it helps with the comprehension and uh, uptake. And then you are invited to these coaching sessions that you're present for right now. We also then put you into our Vet to CEO Master's program, which is a little more in depth, uh, two hour sessions, nine weeks long. The first one will be starting on August 30th. And after that, you are invited by invitation, um, select group to our business showers where we give you laptop computer, um, a business suit, web development and SEO, and uh, professional headshots and videography for your website. And also, it, everyone participates in a pitch competition for the potential uh, grand prize of a five-figure grant. So after that, we continue to offer mentoring and support and try and give you the tools that you need to be successful in business. Back to you, Griff. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate that. All right. Now, it's my honor to introduce our special guest speaker, a one-of-a-kind commander. General Stan McChrystal is known for helping elite teams tap into the potential of their people to better compete in a complex and interconnected world. Called one of America's greatest warriors by Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, few can speak about leadership, teamwork, technology, and international affairs with as much insight as General McChrystal. After retiring from the US Army as a four-star general, General McChrystal turned his expertise into the business world. He is the founder and CEO of the McChrystal Group, which helps Fortune 500 companies using his unique perspective, the intersection of business, academia, and the military. Tonight, we are honored to have him share that perspective with us. And now, we give you General Stanley McChrystal. Hey, Griff, thanks. Much. And, and thanks for everybody for the opportunity to be on here today. Let me tell you why I believe in this and why I'm, happy, I'm really excited to be here today, because I started a business 12 years ago. I came out of the military, didn't want to go do the sort of normal things that retired senior military do. Started a business with no capital, no business experience, no business plan, not squat. And we just started and we've been at it 12 years. It has not been easy and it never does get easy but it's been fascinating. And we've got a hundred people now and it's turned out to be a, a real journey. But, but one that I would, would have hate to have missed. And so although I started it much later in life than most of you, I would tell you this is a great thing to take on. And, and because it's hard doesn't mean you're not doing well. What I wanna talk about, because I can't talk about a whole range of things, but I imagine there's some people on this call that I had the opportunity to serve with, and thank you for doing that. And also have probably experienced a couple of crises. So what I'm gonna talk about tonight is leading through crisis. Because if you start a business, you are going to experience some crises. Some of them are gonna be internal in your business. Some of them are gonna be external. 
whether it is a pandemic or a financial crisis or something that you don't cause or control, but it is going to put you in an environment where you've got to act in a crisis mode. Most veterans have been through crises of different kind before, but I thought I'd, I'd talk about two crises and then give a little framework on what I learned or what I came away believing about those. The first crisis was the spring of 2005, and I was commanding the organization called JSOC, or Joint Special Operations Command, which is America's Counterterrorism Forces. What that really meant is during that period, we were most engaged in the fight against Al Qaeda overall, but the hardest fight was Al Qaeda in Iraq, obviously inside Iraq. I'd taken command in the fall of 2003, so I'd been in command for almost two years. And in the late spring of 2005, it looked as though we were about to lose. We being the coalition forces, the United States, and of course the, the fledgling Iraqi forces that we were allied with. Al Qaeda had actually seized terrain. They had seized the Western Euphrates River Valley, which stretched from Syria, Al Qaim, on the Iraqi side of the border, all the way down the Euphrates River Valley into Baghdad. And during that period, a terrorist group now controlled terrain. They even in the Al-Qaeda area established what they called Iraq, the Islamic Republic of Al-Qaeda. And this was two things. One, it was a direct military threat to our defeat in Iraq, but it also, from an information standpoint, it made everything the United States was doing there look absolutely uh, vulnerable because they were on the front page of paper, they controlled terrain, they controlled population and things like that in that area. And so that, that sort of was uh, flashing red lights that things were about to go down the drain. During that period, I'm commanding a counter-terrorist force focused on high value targets, going after enemy leadership. When General Casey directed us to become the main effort. And I said, well, Counterterrorist forces like us can't become the main effort. And I need you to do that because right now you're the force with the flexibility to go out and contest the Western Euphrates River Valley. And so we had to go out into this area that, that went basically from northwest to southeast and start to wrest control back from Al Qaeda in Iraq. Now we couldn't control terrain over long term. So we needed ground forces to come in, but it was gonna take time for Marines and other forces to come in and actually start to occupy the areas. But we had to go out and do the initial fight, which went on for several months. This is late May, early June, 2005. And one third of JSOC is in the fight. That was our model. One third's in the fight for four months at a time and then we rotate another one in. <clears throat> and during that four months, the force fights every night. So it's very high intensity. Then you rotate them back, they go on an alert cycle for worldwide missions and then a training and prep cycle. But we also stole or borrowed a lot of people from the elements back in the rear so we could augment the elements forward and do some additional things. So we were cheating on the third already. <clears throat> we pushed forces out to uh, Al Qaim and then other locations down and we got very, very aggressive, but it was far from our main base at Balad. And very quickly we started taking casualties. We started taking significant casualties and in a counter-terrorist force, taking casualties is disproportionately painful because People have served together for a decade sometimes in small assault units. And so everybody's, everybody else's kids, godparents and things like that. So you can't just bring additional forces. It takes so long or individuals in because it takes so long to select and train them. So it really became an extraordinary moment of crisis. What we had to do was stand this initial crisis, which was a crisis on the ground militarily, but also one of confidence to the force. There was a sense that JSOC was putting itself at risk and we had to make a decision. And the decision was, do we put more force into the fight? And what we did was I made the decision to put two thirds of JSOC in the force or in the fight, which meant that you couldn't do the rotation and suddenly that's 
by definition unsustainable. So from early June 2005 for the next six months, we put two thirds of the force into the fight. Now, when we did it, when I made the decision, I knew it was unsustainable. It was clear across the force. And inside the force, there was a lot of feedback to me that I was putting the force at risk. I could break the nation's counterterrorist force. There was less push from the outside because people didn't understand that dynamic. But there was a clear understanding that we had, we bet an awful lot on this, so much so that the planner and the unit that the plan, the reinforcement, codenamed it Snake Eyes because it was a roll of the dice. Uh, I will tell you for two or three months, it was touch and go. And as the commander and person responsible for the force, it wasn't clear to me that we were going to be successful. It was just clear to me that we couldn't do anything else, in my opinion. We had to take that chance. And we did it. Finally, about September, October, it was clear we were becoming successful and it was going to have paid off. And, and after six months, we were able to lower it. But during that period, I'll talk about some of the things in a moment that became important for the success there. But, but it was a crisis and it was a crisis in my mind and it was a crisis in the minds of the command as well. The second experience I had actually came after I left JSOC and I was back in the Pentagon as the director of the Joint Staff. And many of you remember there was an infected hard drive that was planted by, we believe, Russian intelligence sources and got put in a DOD computer and it went across uh, DOD's computers with incredible speed and incredible pain. The defense or response to that became known as Buckshot Yankee. And what we had to do was we had to first figure out what the threat was, where it emanated from, and what we had to do. This was the first big cyber attack that went down from the tactical level, really up to the strategic level, because it actually infected up into strategic command entities as well, uh, that constituted an extraordinary threat. The thing that was interesting at that point, because I was in a position to watch Admiral Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chief, make the response to that, was the fact that early in the crisis, I saw one individual, Admiral Mullen, essentially sensed that the crisis was bigger than other people were identifying it. We were getting some reports and he had been reassured by a number of responsible people in key jobs that said, don't worry about it, we got this. And there was something in his gut that says, I don't think we do got this. And so he kept bringing in experts and he kept forcing the, the system to give him more data. So he had a sense on whether we really first understood it, second had it contained, and third, were we doing the mitigating actions? And pretty quickly, he came to the conclusion that it was far more serious than people realized or admitted, and that the actions to fix it needed to be more energetic, more focused, more directed from the Pentagon than, than uh, we'd expected before. And I came away with the, the conclusion on that one, and it took 14 months actually to, to clean that up and some pretty difficult decisions had to be made. Many of you might have been infected by stopping the use of uh, thumb drives, things like that during a, they were an essential part of the convenience of operating. But I watched a leader, the chairman, push big entity that is DOD into focusing, into acting, into accepting accountability for and so I walked away with some pretty good lessons, I believe, uh, from observing somebody who I thought did a really good job of it. So what I'd like to do is step back and talk about a crisis, leading during a crisis, the kind of thing that, again, we're all going to experience more often than we'd like, and just throw some ideas or conclusions that I've reached about it. The first thing is most crises are about 85% the same in what you have to do. And you say, well, wait, a pandemic's different from a financial crisis, which is different from a terrorist attack. Well, it's true. But in reality, they're only about, in my view, 15% different. 
about 85% of what you do is very basic stuff. And it's common to each. And if you understand those actions and you can do those aggressively and effectively in an organization, then you leave yourself room to focus on that unique, smaller subset that have to be addressed to that particular crisis that you're facing at the time. The first thing I'd say is work to establish ground truth. Figure out what is happening. That's easy to say, and it's often very, very hard to do. And it can take the kind of ferreting out that Admiral Mullen did, but it's also helped by being able to identify information sources that you trust and you can go to easily. So identifying that ground truth needs to be the first thing. You need to determine if you've got a crisis, what is the crisis? And then from there, you can start to think about what to do about it. The second is identifying that there's a crisis. You know, this would seem self-evident. You know, people see the house on fire. Everybody knows it's on fire. That's not actually what happens in organizations. In many cases, there is a crisis that people either don't recognize because of their particular perspective or background, or sometimes it's their attitude. Sometimes people don't want to identify a crisis because if you identify a crisis, you identify things you've got to change or do about it. So you'll often get a certain number of people sitting in the back of the conference room going, let's not rush to failure. Let's just take this carefully and slowly. And those people always irritate the life out of me because they're trying to make you seem like a panic artist. And I'm not advocating being a panic artist, but sometimes you got to get moving and you've got to get everybody's attention. Sometimes you got to, you know, snap people to the fact that, A, we got a major problem. In Iraq, I had to convince some people we were not only losing the fight at that point against Al-Qaeda in Iraq, we could lose. We could lose to a terrorist group. We could lose a war to a terrorist group. And that's not often in the mindset of the American military, particularly at that point, because the first Gulf War, big win, the initial invasion of Afghanistan, the initial invasion of Iraq, had bred a certain feeling of omnipotence in our force. And then when we started to struggle, I think it became difficult for some people to get their minds around the fact that, as I used to tell people, there's going to be a winner and a loser in this fight. And it's not determined which we are going to be yet. But understand that this is and, and our opponents are going hard. So identify the crisis and get them to accept the fact there is a crisis. Again, that doesn't mean panic. But that means a sense of urgency. The next thing is communicate. And this seems self-evident. But when we talk about communicate, the first thing is you have to communicate what you know as clearly as possible and as often as you can. There are many things in a crisis that you will not know. You will just have gaps in your knowledge. And I would tell you, you need to identify those to your people. You need to say, this is what we know. This is what we do not know. Understand that anytime you are silent or just don't address an issue and you, because you don't want to scare the people in your organization or cause concern, what happens is they communicate anyway. And so, but often the information that's communicated is incorrect. And sometimes it will be very dark information meaning that vacuum will be filled with terrifying possibilities. And if you're down in the organization, you will start to hear rumors about things that you may never be considering, but people will fill the airwaves and people's minds with that. And so it's important that you identify, you know, don't pretend you don't know more, but you have to compete with this information that wants to fill the crevices and, and uh, vacuum spaces how long do you have to do that? Forever. You have to do that through the entire crisis. Now, it's also an opportunity not only to educate and inform your people, it's an opportunity to lead because by communicating how you communicate, the tone you use, your ability to do that can buttress your role 
as a credible leader in the organization. First as a credible communicator, and then people will develop confidence in what you communicate and in you as a leader. They probably already have it, but it's always tested in the middle of a crisis. The next thing I'd say is you have to identify what's got to be done about it. And sometimes that's not immediately clear. You may know we've got to solve this, we've got to drain the swamp, but you may not know what actions have to be taken to accomplish that. But you can identify first the key things, outcomes that have to be reached. And then you can start leveraging the talent in your organization to identify the actions that will get you there. And that's always a give and take across your organization. I would urge you to, to seek as much input from inside uh, your organization as you can get on ideas because then they have a greater sense of ownership, but also identify when the decisions for those have to be made. And decision-making can be tricky. The first thing about decision-making is you identify what decisions have to be made based upon what outcomes have to be reached. But it's sometimes not clear when you have to make that decision. You know, we, we like to be quick on making decisions, but sometimes you don't have to make a decision till later because you can't act until later for any number of limiting factors. And so there might be no advantage in making a decision earlier rather than later. And this is where you've got to understand how long, when the outcome is needed, how long it takes for the action that comes from your de decision to be implemented takes, and then any limiting factors to when you can make it. And then you identify the time, date, time by which the decision has to be made. And often people fail in the other way too. They defer decisions because they want more information and they they don't realize that the time it takes to implement that decision is going to run past the time you need the outcome, in which case the decision is a failure almost by definition, because you haven't given people enough time to get it done and therefore have the uh, outcome. The other thing that I've learned about decisions, and I learned this from one of my mentors, is there should be two phases to the decision making process, obviously phase one and phase two. Phase one, you go to as many stakeholders as possible and time allows and get their inputs, identify the problem, get their inputs on what the decision should be. And then you make the decision, but you, you've shown people the respect and you've gotten good ideas and whatnot. Once you end phase one, you go into the implementation phase. And that means you are executing the decision you have made. At that point, it should be culturally accepted in the organization, that the only time you will relook, reconsider that decision is if new information that wasn't available before that changes the calculation significantly becomes available. Someone who just doesn't like the decision you made or wants to re, uh, readdress it comes into your office or walks down the hall with you and says, hey boss, I think you got that one wrong. I'd like you to reconsider. That's a foul. And it's a foul because even though they may have a good point, as soon as you fall prey to that, then everybody becomes conditioned that decisions that you make are likely to change, be reversed. And absent, as I say, that new information we talked about, once they think there's a chance decisions will be reversed, they start pulling their punches on implementation. Some people who don't want to do it, they just kind of wait and they want they hope it'll be reversed because they don't really want to do what you said in the first place. So it's critical that people believe decisions are final and they get executed vigorously. That the last two points I'd make seem obvious, particularly with people of military background, but you have to lead through this. And that means you need to figure out what the organization needs. Sometimes your organization needs that spoke person communicate, and that may take the majority of your effort. But other times you have to get down as close to where people are doing the job as possible. You need to be on the ground, working with your frontline people, dealing with customers or with a problem or whatever your organization does. You've also got to be there to keep your finger on the pulse, to monitor what is happening, to have that sense, because if everything gets to you through six filters. By the time it gets there, 
it's not going to be the same information. You also have got to be able to communicate to your organization your commitment, your energy, your uh, standards for the outcome. Nobody can do that. Your subordinate leaders can all be extraordinarily helpful, but nobody has the effect of the senior leader in an organization saying, this is important by their very presence, by their very focus. When I took command of the counterterrorist forces in 2003, the initial concept was that I would operate from back in the United States and travel forward periodically and sort of supervise what went on. And on my first trip over, my first week in command, I realized if I was going to lead the forces in war, I need to be there. And I need to be there all the time because that would signal to everybody where I placed the priority. And so that's what I did. And I think it made just an extraordinary difference. Finally, the last thing is adjust as necessary. We're all gonna fall in love with our plan. We're gonna fall in love with what we're starting to do. And we're a little hesitant to make course corrections when necessary. I think we have to have the humility to do that. And you need to communicate to that to the organization, not a lack of focus or will or uh, commitment to the outcome, but the willingness to pay attention if the wind is blowing this way and then suddenly adjust your sails and show people what we're going to do is whatever it takes to be successful. And if the formula that it takes to be successful changes in route, that's what we're going to do. We're not stupid. And so I think it's critical that we remember this as we go into crises. Now, not all crises are a cyber attack or, you know, a story in combat. But I will tell you, in, in my small company, when uh, COVID-19 hit in the spring of 2020, it was a crisis because the first thing most companies did was they stopped all consulting. They just they put a hold on it. So our revenue essentially went almost to zero overnight. That's a crisis. And I think most of our organizations are going to run into things like that periodically. Let me stop there and I, I'd certainly open it up and welcome any feedback or questions anyone might have. Griff, go ahead and uh, open it up to questions for the, for the group. We can maybe do five, five minutes or so of questions and we'll go from there. Sounds great. So, uh, Vetrepreneurs, if you could uh, enter questions in, uh, in, the, uh, in the chat, and then we will, you know, either Sarah or Ken will, will uh, or April, either one, <laughs> will uh, we'll host those questions and, uh, and deliver them to the general. Okay, it looks like Zach Ruiz has a question. Go ahead, Zach. What's going on? Sorry, I was actually going to try and type it. I didn't want to interrupt yeah, anyone, but if I can ask, that works. Yep, yeah. that works. Might go a little faster that way. Go ahead. Yeah, awesome. Uh, thanks, sir. Actually, I saw you speak at uh, the Y in New York in 2014. I was at uh, JP Morgan. We exchanged emails once or twice. Love yeah. everything you're doing. Love everything you're doing with the organization. Uh, so I took some notes. Just wanted to confirm here. So I got your I got your your six things, and maybe I missed something. But it's uh, work to establish the ground truth, right? Identify the crisis, get them to accept the fact that there is a crisis. Communicate. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. Identify what's got to be done about it. And that was that was a great one. Lots of bullet points there. Lead through this. So figure out what the organization needs and then adjust as necessary. Was that it? Yeah, there's actually another one I'd throw in there that's sort of obvious. Establish accountability. When you when you identify those necessary actions, give it to somebody. Make sure you, as we used to say, a throat to choke. So yes. that somebody knows who's responsible, because there's that old saying, if three people are responsible for feeding the dog, the dog's going to starve. Correct. Awesome. Well, you know, so I was, I was infantry in uh, 04 to 06. So I was there during the surge, not with JSOC, but just doing the do. I was on a mid team. And I love the one where it's, uh, you know, it, once you once you implement and you get everyone's input, then then execute, right? Because you don't want people coming in to relitigate. And I, I thought that was a great point. So thank you. And I'll open the floor to everyone else. Thanks for all you've done, Zach. Thanks, Zach. That was great. Uh, Doug Slattery, you had a great question as well. Feel free well, to read that off, or are you going to read it yourself? Doug? No, no, go for it. You can, uh, Doug. Doug, you're good to you're good to ask. 
the general. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Requested. Uh, pleasure to meet you, sir. Uh, Stan, as much as. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, when you switched or transitioned from you know your military career into entrepreneurship. Uh, did you have a challenge with a shift of mindset to new challenges? Because um, as uh, you know, a military leader, you're generally giving orders, but as an entrepreneur, you're kind of doing all those orders with the different hats. So I'd like to hear your experience around that. Yeah, Doug, it's a really good point. I did struggle with it. And some of the people who joined the, or formed the company with me, we all had sort of similar problems. The first was exactly right. We're all in the military where a lot of systems exist. There's a personnel system, a finance system and whatnot. You just assist in that ecosystem. We had to build all of that from scratch. And so how you build those things, you don't want to replicate the military, but you've got to put order into an organization pretty quickly. I think the second thing was interestingly, You'd think that we would want to come out and be soldiers and therefore we would establish discipline, clear standards, et cetera. We actually overcorrected the other way. We came in and we said, well, we're not soldiers now. We're working with a bunch of young people who are surveying because most of our company that we brought in were not military. And so we, we bent over backwards not to do things that seemed military-like. The reality was we had thrown out the baby with the bathwater because the things we had learned that were very good, which were clearly established standards, expectations for everyone, norms for how we interact. We tried to be a little bit casual in my opinion. And the military people sort of in their back of their minds felt like they had that and therefore we could be. But for the young people, it was very confusing. And so, over time, we found we lacked a lot of those clear standards and expectations and, and things like that. And we had to try to go in and do that. Let, well, we have done going in and done that later, but it would have been much clearer, easier and less painful for everybody to use the things that are appropriate from the military from the beginning. You don't have to be overly military, but there are just some good foundational things I would urge you to, to hold on to. Thank you. Uh, sir, we have one, one of our vets are asking, do you have a, is there a leadership book that you recommend for entrepreneurship? Yeah. Having written four books, of course, I got four books that yeah, yeah. <laughs> I recommend. there are some really good ones. So I, I mean, things like the innovators dilemma and things like that just really give you a sense on the flexibility to be an entrepreneur. Um, so that, that's the way I'd go. I would, you know, there are a lot of worthless books out there too. So I'd go to find two or three, but I wouldn't wear your eyes out reading 50. Great. Uh, we, have, we have one from Michael Laguerre. Let's just give me one second. I'm just trying to find it. Uh, Michael, would you like to, would you like to ask it? Yes, General. Uh, General, I have to say, I've been kind of quietly fangirling out over here. It's an honor to be able to address you. And uh, one frustration I always have is when dealing with civilians rules and regulations, especially when trying to get through all the red tape and the proverbial, uh, you know, like hoop jumping, do you ever like get frustrated because when you can wave your four star hand and you know, things would be done uh, for potentially thousands of troops all at once do you ever get frustrated and just almost like want to i hate to say it, but start knife handing people yeah i wanted to punch people in the face that that was my response um yeah it just drove me absolutely nuts particularly when the the right answer is self-evident to everybody and somebody gives you this either bureaucratic or slow roll kind of thing like that or won't make a decision drives me crazy you almost need somebody that you is your advisor, counselor, coach who talks you off the ledge. I need that all the time. Because on the one hand, you need your energy, you need your focus, you need to not accept a bureaucracy, but at the same time, you can't go knifing people. And so what you need is to be able to just sort of vent that without losing your passion. One thing is I would never accept too much once you start accepting too much bureaucracy, either in your organization or that you interface with, you really weaken it. I appreciate that, sir. Thank you. Thanks for all you've done. 
All right. So we have, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have one time for one more question. Michael, the other Michael who has his hand up. Um, I don't see a last name, but Michael, I know you've been waiting for a second. We have one time for one more question, then we're going to have to move on. Um, so Michael. Oh, thank away. you. I'll just, uh, asking very quickly, what advice would you have for people that have been out of the loop for an extended time, but who have a lot of credentials, a lot of experience, a lot of talent? Yeah, that's a really tough one because people automatically discount it. They say you haven't been around for a while, so you do. So I would pick something very specific that you believe you are able to be value add. Don't just come in and say, I'm an experienced leader with a lot of things, et cetera, et cetera. Come in and say, I'm really good at accomplishing this. And if you've done something similar in the past, I would almost have your resume be like a little case study and say, okay, here's a problem that I solved. I've seen that. Now, obviously, if you could pick a problem that you think fits for the organization, because organizations will hire someone if they believe they've got a very specific ability to fix certain things, uh, where the, the generalist, you know, the good leaders led 5,000 people doesn't translate to a lot of opportunities on the outside. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Great answer. So I, uh, sir, by the way, uh, Jason Van Camp here uh, has something he would like to present to you. So uh, Jason, do you want to, do you want to take a moment? Sure, Griff. So, sir, thanks for being here. Thanks for your support. Thanks for everything you're doing for our veterans. Uh, we're really excited because um, we have a, a gift for you, an award. You know, we, we help veterans and their immediate family members start or accelerate their own businesses. And one of our veterans, his name is Justin Clapsaddle. He was one of the first veterans at Warrior Rising. He started a company called War Metal Knives. And so he forges knives. He repurposes metal from vehicles that were destroyed in combat and he turns them into, into knives. So we started out with uh, metal from vehicles that were destroyed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we have some Vietnam metal from, from helicopters. We have some metal from Sherman tanks that fought in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. And today, um, Ken, if you wouldn't mind showing the picture, we have a- Sir, if you can direct your, your, to Ken Venera's screen, you'll see Ken is showing you a, a picture. Not sure if you can see it. Sorry, Jason. If we can pin Ken uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the screen, everybody can see the, the knife. So we have a, a gift for you. It's a war metal knife from a Sherman tank that was in the Battle of the Bulge. So Justin uh, took that metal. He put a little Damascus steel in there, and we have that knife for you. And we're going to send that to you as a thank you for being here, for supporting Warrior Rising, and for the, uh, the amazing words that you imparted to our veterans. So thank you again, sir. Appreciate it tremendously. Well, you're kind, Jason, and thank you for what you guys are doing for veterans. And thank veterans for what they're doing. We need you in the business world. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Now, feel free to stick around. We're going to have some breakout sessions, uh, some coaching sessions. Join anyone you'd like. And if you have to go now, we totally understand. You've got your grandkids and everything. Uh, so, so thank you again, and we'll turn it back to Griff.